Live from the living rooms, it's the director's chair with Stanton Welch. Hi everybody, I'm Stanton Welch from Houston Ballet and here with our next installment of our vlog, we have Melody Manichi Welsh. Hello Melody, how are you? Hello, I'm good, how are you? Good, how have you been going through this crazy time? Good, lots of adjusting, uh, sleeping in. <laughs> our schedule's all out of whack, but we're, we're figuring out our new normal. Um, yeah. <laughs> and school online and everything? Yeah, so Isaac's in high school, my son Isaac, um, and that's been really interesting to try to navigate, figuring out where all the assignments are going up on different sites and apps yeah. and stuff like that, so it's going okay. He hates it. He, he would way <laughs> rather be with his friends in person, but you know. <laughs> well, yeah. all of us, I think. Yes, yeah. So uh, let's just for everybody here get to know you a little bit better. Could you tell us where you're from? And what was the very first moment you realized that you wanted to dance or be a dancer? Mm. Yeah, so I'm from California. I'm from um, the Bay Area, a little town called Santa Cruz. And um, yeah, I think the first moment that I knew I wanted to be a dancer was when I, um, I must have been three or four and my mom had signed me up for a, they were called combination classes where you go tap, jazz, and then ballet yeah. <laughs> all in one class. And, uh, and so I went to try on a pair of tap shoes um, in the, our little mall in Santa Cruz. And the second that I like went out of the store onto the tile floor and I started hearing the sound of the tap shoes, I just, that was it for me. I just, always wanted to dance I also thought that was the coolest thing ever to like hear my feet making the sound <laughs> so that was the moment for me <laughs> and went into ballet yeah so I did ballet in that class too like at the end of it which was again ballet um but when I was nine I started training classical ballet at like a local school that did Vaganova um technique training and um Yes, and I would say that the moment for me in that class, my first class in level one when I was nine, was actually, I remember looking over at the girl next to me in the port de bras preparation to put her hands on the bar, and I like watched her do this like amazing flowery port de bras, and I was fascinated and just loved the drama of it and everything. <laughs> Yeah. And, th and then you came to Houston Ballet Academy. Um, when was that and how long were you in the school for? So uh, I first came to a summer program when I was 13. Um, it was my first ballet summer program away from home. And I, I came for th three summers in a row. So 13, 14, 15. Um, I also went a few other places at, before I came to the year round program. And so I actually got a call from Clara Cravey, used to be, I think, the principal of the school. And she called my mother when I was in D Washington, D.C., training with Suzanne Farrell. And uh, we had a little bit of like a, I don't know, like a West Side Story moment where Suzanne went and sat me down and talked to me about if I wanted to do Balanchine, it had to only be Balanchine. And then um, Clara was saying, you know, we have a spot for her in the school. And I was like, Ugh. Um, gratefully, I've gotten to do Balanchine and be in Houston Ballet. So that's, that's nice. <laughs> but yeah, that was the moment where I, I came for the school when I was, um, I was 16. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get to join a company. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it's such a change. Like you go from being working all the time and the star of the school, and then you're back into the into the company um could you talk a little bit about that what was do you have memories of what that felt like or when you went wow this is this is big yeah yeah um i was really surprised that i got a contract <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, it felt so competitive and it was so intense in the school um, when I was in there. So I really felt like we all guessed wrong. Like none of us knew who was going to get a contract. Um, and so there was the shock of that, of like, oh my gosh, like I've only been in the school for one year and a lot of people were there for two years. And so, um, yeah, I, 
it was my first like grown up dancing job. I had to quit my job at Chewy's, <laughs> being the, ho <laughs> the hostess that got yelled at all the time. I worked and at I Kentucky was... Fried Chicken for a year. You what? I worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken for a year. Oh, really? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So I was a hostess at Chewy's and I was a telemarketer for Houston Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> to to earn money to live in Houston and so it was a big it was a big shift for me to actually be living that dream and be okay now this is my job actually um and I think the biggest adjustment for me was the big pond kind of thing little fish in big pond and feeling like I had to learn how to motivate myself sometimes ask for corrections rather than a teacher kind of being on top of me and feeding me that and making the opportunity for me it was like all right you got to make something of this now and that was like very different um it, it was it was hard but I, I learned from watching i think the different approaches in the company the different dancers in the company and how some of them just kind of like would lag in that and be like uh whatever and would ride on like a lot of talent. But again, I think I was like, well, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> have to do a little more maybe to hold my spot here. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember what your first uh, big role was? A role that you really felt like, uh, well, yeah, wow, this is, I'm, I'm opening something or was it just something sometime you got noticed or chosen for something or you felt this huge responsibility? Do you have one of those uh, moments? <laughs> Yes, um, I have, I, I feel like I have a, a lot of them that have probably kept me, you know, going. But uh, the first one that comes to mind really early on was uh, doing, working with Paul Taylor. <laughs> we used to do like, there, when I first got in the company, we were in a period of doing a few of his pieces. And he came and he did a new one on us. So we did Company B. And I got to do the rum and Coca-Cola girl. And I was an apprentice and so that was a really big deal to get to do a solo and you know kind of a featured role um and then when he came he was so fun and wacky <laughs> to work with and i did i was casting his other piece too and so he paid individual attention to me which was kind of hard because not everybody liked that <laughs> and i did not like being in the hot seat but it was also really cool it felt like a big responsibility to be like okay i have to really prove myself then um because i yeah. got to do those things yeah yeah that's a big one yeah <laughs> I mean, he's a star of the ballet world or of the dance yeah. world yeah yeah, um, yeah. what about I'll never i'll never forget he said <laughs> he said where are you from you're so exotic <laughs> And I thought that was so strange. And I honestly thought, because he was very quite old when he was here, that because I don't think of myself as looking very exotic. So I was like, well, I'll take it. But I think, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, do you have a story of a role or a time when you, as a dancer, where you were thrown on into something, where you had a little bit of notice, you had to do it with a new partner, or maybe a role you didn't know, or a ballet you didn't know, and you had a day or two or an hour or 10 minutes? Do you have one of those those stories? I feel like I've blocked them all out because it's so <laughs> scary. <laughs> yes, I I am sure that I've had those. I feel like in my experience, there's been more instances of like something like that happening and me preparing for it, and then it didn't actually happen. But it's still I still got that like heart rate yeah. up. Yeah. Um, yeah, what I don't I, I literally think that sometimes I just like forget <laughs> because it was too traumatic. <laughs> oh. I, just, I remember being thrown on in a ballet Romeo and Juliet and I it was the Tarantella and I said I can do it, it's the other side. And then when I got into it I realized how complex it was and that it was yeah, a, a much scarier thing than what I had signed up for. <laughs> yes, yeah. You've had partner changes in Nutcracker, I think, at the last minute. At some, <laughs> yeah. What I mean, one that comes to mind is um, dancing with uh, Aaron Sherat in for Sugar Paw, and we got to, we did get to go over it. I think maybe after class the day of. And what's so funny about that is that, like, I 
I was freaking out. So I was like, I have never danced with him. <laughs> Just, and it's such a hard role anyways. And I think that was the added, like, what's going to happen? And it was great. <laughs> it was fine. It was like, I worked myself up and then it was a fine show. And so that was funny. <laughs> it's sometimes part of the fun of it. There's, there's a different adrenaline to it. Yeah, and, and kind of relaxing into it because, because you need to, because you're like, okay, we just have to breathe. We just have to take it easy. I actually find that that is better sometimes because it's more relaxed. Yeah. Trust your technique. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about roles created on you. You've had lots of, of ballets here that were made on you, but I think uh, let's talk a little bit about Marie and, and what, she means to you as, as a character and also the interesting thing of returning to it over a series of years and how you have changed and, and understand her journey differently. Uh, can you talk a little bit about her and the, the experience of that? Yeah. Um, I think that one of the things that, you know, she, she obviously had this experience of leaving home early, you know, as a, function of being sort of a political pawn but it was like okay off you go and so that's a big yeah. part of the story never going back home um i think that right away that very beginning rang true to me i you know i've been away from home for a long time like many dancers and there's a part of that that's very sad and painful and feels like wow look at all these things that have happened to my family and these people and i've just been over here <laughs> living a dream but like um that's one thing that resonated immediately with me that was like i can i can relate to that you know mm -hmm. um that sort of sudden like and now this is my world <laughs> um yeah and then i mean i think that i relate to her a lot just even as a woman trying to navigate she was in the public eye which as dancers i think we are you know we're kind of it's part of the industry to be scrutinized and picked apart a bit. And, you know, if you're having a hard time, it's sort of like, well, what's going on? There's, there's these big expectations of our bodies and our minds and everything. And she seems to be one of the first public figures of that, where it's like all of her little mistakes or foibles or whatever were just picked apart or in front of everyone. And so she just was so very human, you know, reading about her, like, having a crush on this like count and maybe an affair or a tryst or like it's all these really really human things blown up which i i found very sad and hard to learn about and then just sort of like her being villainized you know she's mm -hmm. she's sort of reduced down to that one quote of let them eat cake and she didn't care that everyone was suffering but that's that not it's mm -hmm. not it yeah and so um i think that being misunderstood as well is another thing that in many aspects of life, I think it's true for everybody, but for me, I felt really like I could really understand so many parts of her that I was learning and could really kind of bring my authentic experience into that. And so, I, I mean, I just feel like it's such an honor also to try to portray someone who was a real living person um, and, and, do my best to um, really make them human. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's one of my favorite things about getting to do her story. And it's interesting, I think, in love affairs in ballet, often you're, we're portraying love or, or death in love, but she has a, a different kinds of love affairs. She has a, a marriage with someone who she loves in a different way, and that's unusual to show in ballet. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's another part of what just makes her, especially in the context of the ballet, like you gave her permission to be such a full person, which it seems she was because we all are, <laughs> you know, but getting to see all of that and getting to even show all of that in a performance is just really unique and fulfilling, I think, you know, she's just so rich. It's not just the two dimensions or whatever. Do you have a, a moment on stage where you're in any ballet uh, sort of become lost in it, that you're so unaware of everything else and you're sobbing or you're laughing or you're feeling it and you have to remind yourself after, oh, that, that's not 
real? Do you have one? Uh, well, I'm sure you do. But do you have one that you remember <laughs> or think about? I mean, I think in Mar Marie's going to be the biggest example of that. It's very hard for me. It's why when it's coming up and people go, are you excited? I go, huh. <laughs> no, that's not the right word. It's very hard to pull out of, of her story for me. And, um, and I, there's like a, it's the, uh, it's the guillotine. <laughs> it's the really, it's like, her, I feel like her heart has just been ripped out and ripped out and ripped out. And so all of that is kind of very like heavy, but then the moment where she walks back and the guillotine falls, you can, when you're sitting on it as Marie, you can feel the vibration of, and the hit of it falling and the sound. And that just always, it's, nobody sees it because I'm covered up. <laughs> but that's the part that sends me into like the deepest crying and just like, it's so, it's so hard to come mm -hmm. out of that moment. It's very painful to even know like, this is real or this was real for people. So it's like, that's a hard moment to kind of shake off and be like, okay, Sure. Now, go home, have a bath or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I get to a place sometimes where I hear the, a part of the score that's emotional or, or that was emotional in the ballet and I immediately have that swell of, of feeling you can't control. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one more question. Um, can you explain, uh, I've been talking to everybody about what is that connection that we have with the live audience when you are on stage and they're there. They, it's so hard to describe that feeling, that give and take or the, the waves of energy or, or what does it mean to be applauded or, or how do you feel? What, can you explain your connection with that, that living audience, that dark space out there? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because when I heard growing up, like, or growing up in the company, sometimes I would hear like the word generous, like either in terms of like, be generous or you, you were so generous. And I would be like, that's such an interesting thing. But I think that that's a little bit the piece of like, uh, feeling really invested and present as the artist on stage, it, I kind of think it almost creates this immediate like break between the edge of the stage and the seats. And it like, it's, it is, it's like a electricity or an energy that kind of goes back and forth. And it's like, you know, they're with you. You can feel, you can almost feel the audience lean in and get quiet. And that's, that's a moment that just is like, I don't know. It's just like we build something together energetically and that just like at the end, the applause is sort of the like culmination of it. Um, I think what's hard as an artist is to question sometimes if you're really present, you know, and if you're ruining it, <laughs> if you're breaking the energy, <laughs> like you want it to be magic every night. And I think one of the things is that it is different every single time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe people are just a little tired or, and that's okay too. But there is sometimes where I feel like the, the presence on stage and in the audience are just so matched and in tune that it's like, it buzzes. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. It's interesting that everyone has sort of talked about referring to when the audience goes so quiet is when you, you can, and you can feel that tension. Um, yeah. that they're ho almost holding their breath. They're attentive. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much and uh, be safe and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.